I did not feel like planting a garden this past spring, which is unusual for me. And truth be told, by the start of summer, I was running on empty. It felt like too much work, overwhelming, too heavy. And combined with the fact that due to the chance placement of trees and buildings on and around our property, there's no real open space that gets a real good strong dose of sunlight for the majority of the day. Things that need partial shade grow well, but things that need lots of sun, not so much. So, be being as the garden was a little on the weaker side last year, that was you know, the icing on the cake for me. We did not have ideal conditions for a garden, but if we wanted to grow anything at home, we had no choice but to plant where we were. For we were planted on that lot, and that's where we'll be as long as we're in Woodbury. So my wife Tuesday uh, and I um, have a friend and that friend helped us with the garden. Um, I'm helping Tuesday a bit with it now, but I kind of left it be till the start of August. And, and our friend who helped us get started this year works in international development in the area of nutrition, farming, and crop development in Nepal. So he did some soil rehabilitation work and some of the things he does to get um, the farmers going who he works with. He worked on one of our sunny herb patches, turning up the earth, um, dealing with the thick underground roots that were there, and he planted some of the seeds he uses with the farmers in Nepal. A special type of hard corn, another long growing flat green bean, another was a, well the third sister type of squash. The corn looks especially uh, good for long roots and breaking up the soil, and maybe next year the soil will be even better. But even this year, even now, the tomatoes are doing well, and we've been eating the green beans for a week. I'd rather have had a yard with a lot of open space and huge amounts of direct sunlight all day long, and I'd rather have had the inspiration to garden like a boss on the land I did have, but I didn't this year. So what we did is we grew the garden as best we could, as we could plant it, with the help we could get, and it will be good enough. I wish I could feel like this all the time, that it will all be good enough, but sometimes I'm grumpy and I grumble and I want things to be different, better. A lot of that going around lately. We are all the stone cutter. Being human means tending to give in to the feeling that your life was once better than it is now or will be better than it is now. No matter what he becomes, the stone cutter was always seen something better that he wanted to be until he ends up right back where he all started from. Now, this is not about the grass always being greener on the other side of the fence. We all tend to compare our insides with other people's outsides, as it said. So we have the illusion of grasses being greener, even when the grass isn't. Although the grass always being greener somewhere else is a lie, so true is the proposition that the grass is never greener somewhere else. Sometimes it is. But the stonecutter story is not a parable about the grass always being greener on the other side of the fence. The stonecutter story is about realizing that everyone and everywhere has disadvantages and advantages. Sometimes these are greater and lesser, but there is no station in life, no place in life, or location in life that's perfect. Better, obviously. Worse, obviously. But perfect? No, hardly. Even things that seem perfect in the life of others only seem that way because we only see it on the outside. We see the clothing, the costume, the mask, and it can be, and usually is, a different story when we see behind the curtain, when we see the face, when we see the naked soul, let's say, of others their heart laid open. When we do, what looked like a better life may indeed be full of pain, hurt, misery, loss, trauma that we can't and don't know anything about. 
None of us can magically change our circumstances, for better or worse, triumph or tragedy, in any given singular moment or day, we are where we are. This week in the Atlantic Magazine, Scott Barry Kaufman has an essay called The Opposite of Toxic Positivity, in which he makes a case for toxic optimism. He discusses not only the inappropriate but inaccurate advice to always look on the bright side. Tragic optimism is the search for meaning during the inevitable tragedies of human existence and is better for us than avoiding darkness and trying to just stay positive. Tragic optimism is a term developed by uh, Viktor Frankl. Uh, it's his term for the search of the search for meaning in light of trauma and devastation and irrationality and the cruelty of humans to another. He came up with this in the wake of the Holocaust. This is, you know, in a sense, the Unitarian Universalist way, tragic optimism. As James Luther Adams taught us, we trust that we have enough human and divine resources to justify hope, ultimate, if not immediate, optimism. Unitarian Universalism does not allow us to fall into uncritical positivity. Neither are we encouraged to give in to negativism, or worse yet, nihilism. Tragic optimism fits our condition and our tradition. We do not dismiss reality even when reality is difficult. Life can be full of suffering, and it can also be full of love. Therefore, we don't deal in empty platitudes, such as telling a person who's lost a loved one that it was God's will, or that the person's in a better place. We don't tell someone who gets fired from a job, or who goes through divorce, or gets cancer, or gets COVID, that everything happens for a reason. We do not believe in redemptive suffering. Suffering is suffering. Suffering hurts. Even though we don't justify trauma by saying the horrible thing was part of a bigger plan or what doesn't kill us makes us stronger, we do admit and we do understand that surviving in itself makes us survivors. And suffering through things and surviving sometimes does lead to some types of personal improvement or benefit in some way. But it is not salvific. And hard lessons are hard lessons learned. And people who have to learn hard lessons or learn something through things they had to suffer through, well, I bet most of them tell you they wish they could have not learned it or gone without. We do not believe in redemptive suffering. We do believe, though, it's possible to learn and improve even from very difficult circumstances that we survive. Psychology calls this post-traumatic growth. Kaufman writes, researchers who study post-traumatic growth have found that people can grow in many ways from difficult times, including having a greater appreciation of one's life and relationships, as well as increased compassion, altruism, purpose, utilization of personal strengths, spiritual development, and creativity. Importantly, it's not the traumatic event itself that leads to growth, for no one is thankful, he points out, for COVID, but rather how the event is processed in its wake. The changes in worldview that result from the event and the active search for meaning we undertake during and after the event. Our congregation has grown during the pandemic. We've grown organizationally, incarnationally, numerically in the Mattituck UU Society. We've grown in our use of technology and we feel a bit more at ease with new ways of doing things. We were forced to deal with the new reality and we did and we have been. We've grown right where we are planted and each day for us as individuals and as a congregation has been a one day at a time journey through this. We've dealt with things as we've had to. We didn't choose what happened to us but, as always, we can choose and we have chosen how to react. We've chosen to learn new things. We've chosen to learn technology that allows us to function when we can't meet in person due to COVID or hurricanes. 
Even as we are surviving, we are getting ready for future growth. And for that, we are grateful, and it strengthens us in our gratefulness. In his essay, Kaufman explains that gratefulness is more powerful than gratitude. He writes, Christy Nelson, the executive director of a network for grateful living, says gratitude is a momentary emotion, but gratefulness is an overall orientation that is not contingent on something happening to us, but rather on the way we arrive to life. Gratitude is good. Gratefulness is even better. Research supports claim that a daily gratitude practice is indeed valuable, but I think the act of stopping and recognizing things for which we're grateful, done with regularity over time, becomes a way of being, a developed and practiced virtue, a habit, a part of our character. Gratefulness, then, I would say, is essential if we are to grow where we are planted. Growing where planted is non-negotiable for some people, such as those fleeing the Taliban in Afghanistan, or Haitians living in the wake of an earthquake, or those displaced by wildfires on our west coast or floods on our east coast. Those in traumatic situations have no choice if they are to survive. They must find a way to make the best of the moment where and when they are. Similarly, all of us dealing with COVID, and it's been traumatic for all of us, for those who have died and lost loved ones who care for the sick and dying, for those who are sick or have been sick, it has been worse. But the pandemic has upended the life of anyone paying attention to medical science and living in our society. We have no choice but to find ways to survive and grow where and when we are. I've said this since the very beginning of pandemic, that the only way we get out of this is to get through it. And the only way to get through it is to go through it together. Let us acknowledge that we will not, each of us, be at our best in any given moment of any given day. And our best will change moment to moment, day by day. But we are all asked to do our best in each and every moment. Let us be forgiving of each other. Surviving pandemic takes a toll on each of us and in ways we ourselves might not even be aware. For some of us, due to health conditions or individual emotional makeup, the practice of suggested guidelines on the best public health recommendations may not even be enough to let us feel comfortable in crowds or indoors, especially with the recommendations getting more strict to be more conservative. So let us all be quick to apologize and quick to offer forgiveness. None of us want to live through a pandemic or a hurricane. Most of us are furious at, or worse at those who are ignorantly and stubbornly insisting on not masking up and not getting vaccinated. But humanity has survived pandemics before. The grass is either greener or grosser, I guess, in a pandemic that you live through as opposed to the pandemic they lived through. People living through pandemics before us did not have a constant 24-7, 365 news cycle that spread not only bad news, but propaganda and conspiracy theories and added literally a world of other stress to that, fighting the pandemic physically and emotionally. It's a pile. People who fought pandemics before us also didn't have vaccines and hand sanitizer or mass-produced high-quality face masks. Until recently, people battling pandemics didn't even know what they were battling. They attributed disease to the gods being displeased, or magic, or the evil eye, or even bad smells, the humors. And that's why we have the medieval paintings of plague times with people wearing those face masks with those long nose because they thought that the, the disease lived in the bad smell of the waste and the spoiling food and body odor and everything else. You know, no one, past or present, ever chooses or wishes or deserves to live through such a time as pandemic or natural disaster or a political nation-failing crisis or fires that destroy everything in its path. 
What we do get to choose, however, is how we respond. John Cobb at Zinn says you can't stop the waves, but you can learn to surf. And so we surf, we swim. If we need to, we tread water. If we need to, we just lay on the water and float. We do our best. In the first book of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, Frodo and Gandalf lament the hand they've been dealt, having to deal with this ring in the Dark Lord. And this is how it goes in the scene. I wish it need not have happened in my time, said Frodo. So do I, said Gandalf. And so do all who live to see such times. But that's not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time given us. All that's left to us is to grow where we're planted. If we need fertilizer, we feed the crops. If we need water, we gather it from the river or the rain. If we don't have the energy, if growing is too much right now because we're overwhelmed or too angry, then we ask for help. And we live the best life we can today, here in the when and where we have been planted.